All right, everybody, welcome to Rana's Radar. Here is another shop tour. Something very special, something that I've been very excited about. I'm about to show you the insides of Greening Auto Company. This is as soon as I walk through the doors. Check this out. There is a lot happening, as you saw from outside. The building is big. Doesn't look very fancy on the outside, but there is a lot inside here, everyone. Jesse Greening, Jeff Greening, we will be having a chat with both of them and getting a lot more on how all of this began. But before we do that, we're going to go for a good tour around the shop, see what's happening, some of the projects, some of the builds, what gets made here, some of the parts, and as well as say hello to some of his people. I don't know about you lot, but I'm excited, so I'm going to go around by myself first, and then we're going to get Jesse on here as well. I'm going to be super nosy and take a good walk around, and as I do that, take you lot along with me. The 57 Corvette in the making. What we saw at the front looked like a 58, so we'll definitely get Jesse to tell us more about those. Let me give you guys a bit of an overview. I met Jesse's wife kids around here as well. I met an uncle, so this is a great vibe here and lots of awesome people working. Hey there, how's it going? There you go. Good, good. What are you working on here today? Doing the exhaust on the Camaro. Let's have a look. So what's your name, mate? Bobby. Bobby. And what is your role here? The fabricator. Fabricator. And this is your workstation? Mm -hmm. Bobby, how long have you been with Jesse for? 17, 18 years. 17, 18 years. Wow, this place is huge. Yeah. You like working here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's super clean and there is a lot happening. Are you always on the classics or do you do some of the European stuff as well? Uh, if we come through here. If it comes here, through here. And what is your favorite thing to work on? I don't know. Anything with aluminum. I like aluminum stuff. Aluminum stuff, okay. So, can you show us some of the other stuff you've been working on? I have a truck. I've done a lot with that. Okay, Bobby, you chopped two inches in the center to yeah, in the make center, it. The center of the doors, the center all of the way doors. around to shorten the cab right along there. So, instead of chopping the top, well, we're doing that too. This is why I love coming to these shops, everybody. Now we know that Jess is a very high-end builder here, so they've seen some of the amazing, outstanding, finished works. But now we get to see something that's right in the middle of it. Chopping tops, I've definitely heard of and I've seen it. But in addition to chopping the top, you're going to chop the centerpiece of the cab as well. Yeah. It's already... See how those were like four inches apart? Yeah. That was the same as that. So two inches have taken out already. And we want to do this All if you want to get a really yeah. chopped cab, a much more mm -hmm. shorter one than just chopping the top. Yeah. 
Wow. And then the fenders have been moved up two inches. And then they've been shortened about three inches. What year Chevy is this? Uh, 48, I think. 48, okay. The grill's been leaned back. Normally those grill bars go straight up and down. Yes. The fenders do look a lot shorter as well. Mm -hmm. Did you have to adjust the firewall because of the doors? Yeah, I made all the firewall. You made this whole piece? Not that piece, but pretty much here forward, all that. Nice. And there's a little removable panel in the back so you can get to the back of the engine because it is shoved oh, so wow. far back. Wow, I'm loving the bed rolling. Is that your work as well? Yes. And is that TIG welding? Or is it yeah, just... Yeah, it's TIG welding. It is TIG welding, isn't it? So where are we headed with this truck? I mean, it's looking killer already and it's not even finished. Uh, we've got to finish up the hood. And what engine and is that? It's an LS, but it's going to have a flat plane crank with a BMW M5 dual clutch transmission. I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are we achieving by combining, combining those together? Dual clutch is going to be like 0.2 second shift time. It's like almost immediate shifting. So would that mean we'd have to have paddle shifters? Yeah. Okay, that would be pretty cool. And then flat plane crank, it'll rev to like 9,000 RPM. And how much horsepower are we expecting with those? Uh, a lot. Probably like eight or nine, I'm guessing. Eight or 900. Maybe. Definitely closer to the 1,000. Wow. Now, doing all this panel work and stuff, obviously you're trying to make it as thin as possible or use the best metal. What do you usually do in order to get a nice lightweight vehicle? Use aluminum as much as we can, I guess. Okay. And we still brace it up as much as we can, but... Mm -hmm. And that and already it, helps... It's where the weight is, too. The engine's so far back. All the weight is going to be in between the wheels. And that helps it. Not to mention the fact that you've already removed so oh, much yeah. by chopping the top, chopping the fenders, chopping the doors. And the cab is one piece to the frame now. Oh, so wow. It's like a unibody. This is the next level of build that's happening. These one piece bodies, one piece, you know, with the Riddler Kindig's um, Corvette, that was all mm -hmm. one piece aluminum body, and that was attached to the frame as well. So. Just easier, makes it all stronger. It makes it stronger, does it? Mm -hmm. And then we'll have the fuel cell or gas tank will be right here in the middle and the batteries in the back. So literally all the weight will be in the middle. In the middle. By attaching the cab to the frame, and this might be an easy question for you, but I'm trying to understand how does it still work with the suspension and the wheels, everything moving and turning the car? Well, the... Well, the wheels and all that is still part of the chassis. Okay. So that's not, we haven't really disconnected any of those things. So they're all just connected to the chassis, the chassis is connected to the cab. Mm -hmm. They're still functioning as per normal, it's just all together now. Yeah. And we the, can see that more here. All right, when do you think this is going to be finished? I have no idea. No idea. Do you, do you know what color it might end up as? Nope. Oh, yeah, I do have to know the color. I've got a rendering of it. You've got a rendering? Oh, we would love to see a rendering. Hopefully this is allowed and let's have a look. It's not one of those ones where we can't show it. Oh, nice. Check this out, everyone. That front is so different. Wow. 
that's going to stand out. Mm -hmm. And once someone sees it, they're always going to remember that pickup. If you can show me or teach me something, what are you going to okay. show me, Bobby? You want to try to bead roll something? I would love to bead roll. I am fascinated by that. And I love the patterns and some of the work that you can do in addition to strengthening the metal, which is what I first um, found out when I was learning about bead rolling. So we got a piece of metal right there, sheet metal. You want to just draw something? Or okay, yeah. Any ideas? So I can draw something and then we take the pattern over to the machine. Yeah. This should be fun. I'm excited. Okay, so bead rolling, what is the tip? Make it something big and simple, obviously, or anything? Uh, I mean, I normally kind of go off of the other contours of the other parts. Okay. But, I mean, we're just freestyling, so. So if we're freestyling, let's see. I don't know. <laughs> Not the best drawer, everybody. Um, am I am I putting too much on this? <laughs> oh, it's, it's up to you. How much work am I going to put on it, right? Yeah. Well, let's try and do something like that. Okay. The basic car slammed to the ground. Let's see. <laughs> All right, I'll take this, you take us to the machine, and let's see the machine first, how it works. And hopefully I won't break it. Or Jesse would be like, Rana, you're never allowed in my shop again. <laughs> so basically, the two rolls, wheels just gonna roll. And you're, pre you're pressing on the paddle it's there? This is the foot pedal. Okay. And then it's, that die is pushing up and that die is pushing down. Okay. So it's creating a step. So. And does it matter how hard you press on that? No. Okay. It's pretty much on and off. And you're adjusting that to how thin the sheet metal is? Uh, the pressure, amount of pressure you're putting on it. Okay. I made my life difficult by putting all those curves in there, didn't I? A little bit. <laughs> but there's another side if you want to flip it over and do another one. <laughs> I might even just try to make a straight line and get that there straight. I would be happy with that. Okay. You can do that too. All right, I'll let you take this and I'll come around to your side. Well, let's have a look at what I have done here. So I guess if somebody was doing the curves, they would just move the... Sometimes it's best to kind of get down like eye level with it. Okay. So you can kind oh, of because see that where they actually meet. Okay. So I would open this up first. I'm going to give this a go, everybody. Not sure if it's in the right position, but. It's definitely not straight, but it did work and we do have a dent there. So let's try and move this around. All right, people at home must be thinking, she's absolutely nuts, got no idea what she's doing. But you know what? I got a semi-shape in. It's, it's not in the enough. same. Yeah. It's not exactly where my drawing like was. We'll call it a Porsche. 
yeah, it's a Porsche. I was trying to go for more of a bubble top since my, I knew I was not going to be able to get that close. But hey, that's pretty cool. And already, it's stronger. already it's stronger. Can I do one more? Okay. You know where they say quit while you're ahead? I don't usually say that, so I'm going to continue. <laughs> Okay. And it made it even more stronger. Mm -hmm. So no matter how, if the more lines that go on this, the stronger this metal becomes. Oh yeah. Because that's super thin aluminum. It was. And this is why I'm most curious because everybody for my truck, I do want to have some bead rolling on the hood because I hate the C10 hoods. They're just so flimsy. And um, yeah, but this is super cool and I'm going to keep this. Bobby, well, you're awesome. Bead rolling machine, everybody. Love it. If you t it's a matter of, you know, like when they say you've got to perfect the art, take your time. Mm -hmm. We'll figure it out. We'll spend enough time in front of it. Absolutely. I kept worrying that it was going to get stuck here, but you've got all this room that you can put large metal pieces there yeah. to um to work on. That's how I get the floor pans and all the big panels in there. And what about these? What are these? Just different dies for different shapes and so like. That oh, will, I see. That will do like that. Oh, I see. So this is the same thing. It's just not as deep as that one. Wow. How did you learn the skills you do here? Kind of just the hard way. Just the hard most way. Most of it. I went to school too, but most of it I kind of already figured out the hard way. Just by Working on my own stuff. I can't leave anything alone. So I'm always messing with something. And I don't blame you. If I had this machine, I'd be doing all sorts <laughs> of different stuff on it. Love it. Bobby, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. All right, everybody. Let's come over here to George. George, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for allowing me in your space. Tell us about yourself and what is your role here at Greenings Auto? My name is George Lawrence. I've uh, I do the CAD one of the CAD designers that uh, work for Jesse here. Um, get the opportunity to basically well, a lot of people wish to you know do the, do their their dream job. I've done this work um, for over thirty years of my life, and in the last seven years, I've been able to work with Jesse and create all the help create or actually even create myself all the. Um, the billet machining that we do in-house. Wow. Uh, designing wheels, valve covers, new products, and um, just wh whatever customers come to us for, for the builds that they have. CAD work, CNC machining is huge. And you said you've been doing this for 30 years. So tell us or educate us a little bit about exactly what is CAD work and how has it changed from where it was 30 years ago to today? I mean, when I when I first started doing it, working in shops, the the, the solid modeling that we everything we do now was just just at the more in the beginning stages of it, and so a lot of it's still back at the time when you know, and I went to school for all this was you know they're still just doing two handed drawings on on you know uh, drafting tables and and. Uh, you know, a lot more interpretation in, in a machine shop about how they would actually really do that type of work. And then it, it evolved into then when I had the first opportunity in, to work in solid modeling and a few different softwares, it's, it, you actually create what you're machining full-size full size model in a computer, and it's a solid piece. There's no, like, just a shell of it, and you... Depending on the way you do your modeling work, you continue to like cut away and work away until you get the shape you want. 
And it gives you that 3D image you and you can a, see a, it from a, all angles. Yes, a, 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 a spinnable, you know, viewable image that you could look at all sides of it and be able to, you know, know how, and, and that it's great with assemblies and such, which works great on the wheels. Yes. Because it enables us to, to create, like even this, a model like this, a, a product that we're able to make a separate piece that snaps inside of a piece that then we have another piece that even goes into the back. And this is, this is something simple just for a trophy that we're creating for an upcoming show for a Pro Touring Truck Shootout. We do a yearly award for them. Um, we is that the trophy there? That is Can the trophy Can I show right everybody? Here. Yes, by all means. This looks so cool, everyone. Check this out. So this is the trophy for the best billet that you'll be giving out. Correct. And... We're still doing a little mass, little last minute tuning with it. We're also incorporating the pieces I showed before, the the tire and that wheel center, and we have machined those in the past. We're actually doing a 3D printing of them now, and so I mean that's that looks like aluminum, but that's a a piece of of printed plastic, and the 3D printers out in the shop, virtually running every day doing something for us. But it's you know. The piece like I had showed on the back there is, and we're actually able to, to, to print that in color. So we didn't have to fill that piece and we could print in multicolor on these pieces. So that's, that's all one print. We didn't have to do anything in addition after the fact. Wow. Okay. But Fascinated it's, everybody. <laughs> But uh, sorry, it's um, didn't mean to keep going off track and pull no, away from you showing the screen. Um, but yeah, so like I said, that's just... So all the color here is actually straight from the machine. Well, in, on that piece there, in this, parti this well, particular piece... Well, it would be, piece, I'm yeah, guessing. That, in this particular piece is one, the one piece that will bolt onto this base. Those will be billet aluminum, and in that we will engrave the features that you see with filled color and paint. Mm -hmm. And then we simply just brush that back off to leave the paint fill within. And then we'll just have a brush finished everywhere else. Nice. Sort of like the billet piece. It, it just gives it a cool, awesome nice. look. So my understanding is with the CAD work, it starts here, back in the day, pen and paper yeah. on the yes. table, yes. try to make it as 3D as possible. And then with no CNC machines, it would go in and get handmade or whatever machine that they could use, not so advanced we're, 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 like today. We had the, it, it there was CNC the, it, machining? It, 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 there was CNC machining, but it made the programmers and the machine operators' jobs harder. Okay. I'm not saying that's not hard now, but it, it, it was different. Okay. It was the, it, there was more at the time than also machine-wise, like the machines we have shop-wise, they're... Um, you know, modern, you know, CNC machines that, you know... We, we are, we we are going to go and show you guys those machines in the other room as well. That uh, you're, you're able to do on-screen programming on the machine if you needed to. Yeah. Uh, conversational in a sense, but nobody does that anymore. It's now we use... I use... I design in SolidWorks. Yeah. And then we use um, MasterCam software for our machining, for our CAM side of it. CAD is computer assisted or uh, drafting design, and then that is the same for you so know, you're able computer to send it, assisted machine. Send it straight from here, your design, to I'm the machine able, out there. Uh, yes, I, I'm able to send... Well, I, uh, what I do is I send that component to, to our programmer machinist, Wes, he imports the part into the uh, Mastercam software and okay. then writes program to machine the part. Wow. Let's go and have a look at that machine. Let's do that. So this here is the machine shop. Okay. So is this the maestro you were telling me about? Yes. The software. Yeah. Well, that's that. That's you know normally what you know. The, it was more common to actually do on-screen programming for more simpler parts, and you still could if you wanted to. But it makes no sense for us to try with the with the software that we have and the capabilities we have to be able to to create the program that it's needed to make a part, put it on uh, a 
a disc or anything loaded into the machine and and it just you know pulls up the tools and everything that we request from it and it makes the part. Can you make changes to the design over here at this stage or it always has to be done back with yourself? We prefer to have any changes done to the design be part of my design as well and even if in process it's easier for him to change something uh, uh, radius size or anything like that he'll still give me feedback so that I update my model so that yeah. it, it looks like the piece that he's machining. So you've always got so that if we ever finished image. Yeah, finished it. If we ever needed to, if we wanted to make another one or if we ever needed to make another one for an unfortunate circumstance, it would be, you know, I could give him that model and as the latest and he would be able to work from it, so. Okay. This is Wes? Yes. Hi, how's it going? Good. We've just been learning about uh, the printing and the process of how it begins and the computer sends it over to this part of the machine and then you program things. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more? Uh, yeah, I can show you here. Okay. We use Mastercam to do all the programming and basically I get the solid model from George or Greg then I take and basically write these toolpaths basically on how I want to go about cutting it. So like that right there. Okay Wes, so this is, I mean I'm thinking coding. Yes, it's well what this is, does is I write the toolpath and it shows me what it does. And then after I'm happy with what it does, it will, uh, I can convert it to G-code. speed it up to but it basically shows so me is what this telling, do. What, what, okay that's exactly right isn't it yep. I'm understanding that that this is showing you exactly what the machine will be doing mm -hmm. even before it starts so yep. you can see where it's going to be cutting yep. nice. like I can see what the cutter I, I can see a cutter visualization of it right here yeah or I can go to this screen and highlight all my tool paths and it will show me the block and then it's gonna show each tool cutting the block to what it's gonna end up like. Oh wow, I didn't know this. Yeah. Because uh, that's where everything starts off with. I've seen those big blocks. Yeah. Basically, that's all the processes I'm doing on this first setup. Isn't that fascinating, honestly? Mm -hmm. I've always seen that we've seen CNC machining before on the channel as well. And I love, you know, sticking my camera up to the window just to see that process. But before that, you can actually see how that shape is going to take form. Mm -hmm. And then it starts up over there, which is, which is so good because it kind of, you know, before I used to think that someone always have to stand there and watch this machine and make sure that everything is being done right. Generally, the first part you want to, yes. just for a peace <laughs> of, of course, mind. Yep. But then, if you run a bunch of them, like these boat parts that we're running, it's just put Once it in and go it away does from it. Give you a peace of mind. Yeah. And if it doesn't, then I guess that's when you gotta call the company that provided you the machine to say that there is something wrong. This will also tell me, give me a general time a on time how long it how actually long takes take. that process. Wow. Are there machines out there that are faster than others in the market? More precision than faster. Some faster, yeah, but they're all generally about the same speed, but the precision is where you, is the difference. Okay, and how long have you been working on this for? Uh, like this part or here? No, just here. Here? Uh, I think I've been here over 15 years. Okay, you're an oldie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Been I've been here for a while. Wow, nice. And, and is this the only area of auto that you love to work on with the uh, machine CNC machining or is the other stuff you put your hands on as well? I mean, when I was younger, I messed with cars more, but more just making the parts now. This is super cool. Well, hey, Wes, I appreciate this and I'm so happy to see this because I had no idea. Yeah. And, and then I can even actually lay the part up in there to where you can see where it is in the block. Oh, wow. And everything that's going to happen with it. But yeah, that's the 3D printer that he was talking to you about then. Basically, it grows the part from the bed up. Yeah. And then we have all these to where one piece we ran two different colors on. 
So it'll actually change colors in the print. That I haven't seen. I have seen 3D machines before, 3D printing. Mm -hmm. But this is where with all the different colors. Yeah. Comes like you can play. have four of these set up to where you have 16 colors and pull from it to where as long as it's the same material, it'll pull the different color. Okay. And you can basically build like figurines, anything like you could think of. And the big difference with the, um, besides the fact that these are big machines in front of me, and this is a small one right now, but they can get pretty big as well. Oh yeah. Uh, 3D printing is huge. That compared to CNC machining. Now, this is a full block of actual metal that's yes. getting used. Yes. It's the composite, isn't it? It's the material that's yes. different or what yes. you're going to get from a 3D printing machine as opposed to a CNC machining. Almost. Almost. Yeah, there's, one, there's one catch though. What is it? They do have metal 3D printers now. Okay. And you can actually print metal. And as someone who's involved with CNC machining, how do you feel about that? It has its place. It has its place yeah. in certain places, like yeah. not for big parts that you're going to be putting on. No, there's certain parts that where it might take a bunch of setups over there. It's one setup over here. Okay. It's just a matter of time. It's basically like sharp corners and stuff like that. You can't really machine in some cases. Then that's where it will be more helpful to have the yep. 3D printing. And okay. these right here, that part that I'm actually working on, we printed these and it's going to basically hold it like this so I can flip it to machine each side because I'm going to cut both ends and then I'm going to lay it down on its side, machine it, and then rotate it 180. And you just machine. made yourself a tool that you can yes. use. Yes. So that was convenient, wasn't it? Very. <laughs> and how long does something like this um, take in that? Machine, that took, I think, about six hours, and then that one took, I think, three hours. That's not bad. You just leave it there and you continue on with other work. Yep. There's a lot of times that we get it started before we leave, and it's printing through the night. Okay. That is pretty cool. A lot of heavy machinery here. We will be chatting with Jesse in his part of um, the interview and find out exactly what other parts they are making because. There's a lot more than awesome rice that get built here. There's a lot of parts that are getting made. So yep. we'll be more on that later. But hey, Wes, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody, let's meet Greg. Greg, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. We, so you were sitting inside the machine shop. Yep. And I said, well, Greg, what can you show me? And then he goes, well, for what he's going to show me, we've got to go outside. <laughs> Where are we going? Uh, we're going over to this Bronco over here. Okay. And... This is a vehicle that came into the shop for some just general repair work and a little bit of body work and that sort. But it also has fuel injection on it, aftermarket fuel injection. And that's one of the things that we do quite a bit of at the shop here is installs and tuning. Now we didn't install this one, but everything that comes through, we like to make sure is you know top notch and you know, we really focus on the drivability because okay. a lot of things here, you know, they see a lot of miles. It's not a, a pretty car that that never gets driven. And obviously, this is a this is beautiful. It's, for it's a pretty nice car. <laughs> Love the Broncos. But it, you know, but it's not something that you would never drive. It's, yes, it's a drivable car. So even though. It, the drivetrain and fuel injection isn't something that we did. It's something that we're going to make sure is 100%. So how know. does that tie in with yourself from the machine shop? Well, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm an engineer by trade, and that's my education. But I also, you can kind of see over there, that's my Jeep. Oh, my lot. Lord. We, okay, <laughs> we're going to come back to the Bronco. But we have to check out Greg's Jeep. <laughs> So, <laughs> yes, I get distracted easily, but fine. check this out. So this is how, <laughs> this is my introduction to uh, engine calibration and tuning. And so this is what I drive pretty much every day. And what year is this? Uh, 75. Yeah, their two-door wide track is fairly uncommon. And it's dirty, so don't zoom on out too much. <laughs> oh man, forget about that. It's actually looking pretty shiny. Yeah, it's just... Oh, you have fun in this, Greg. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we drive this all over the country and just 
We race it all over the place. It's been pretty much everywhere. But that's kind of how I got into the tuning side of things and why I specialize in the drivability. And it's not just all full throttle performance. It's we have to be able to get in, hit the key. It has to you know, act good in traffic, not overheat, no stumbling. The automatic transmission stuff is, you know, something that gets overlooked a lot too. This is a manual, but we do a lot of automatics here. And How so does it get overlooked? Tell me more about that. Um, so it's very easy to get like the wide open throttle shifting correct, but all the different conditions that you would see in regular driving, you know, it just seems like it holds a gear too long or doesn't want to downshift on its own at the right time and the shift may be too firm. You know, you can have a very firm shift under heavy throttle, but when you're just light driving around, you want it to drive like a regular car and not kick you in the back all the time. Yeah. So because of that and all the, the driving we do in that one, that kind of turned into me doing a lot of tuning and then there was a need for it at the shop. So now we do a lot of that here. Wow. So with a classic like this that comes in, Yep. I'm guessing the engine must be upgraded, no? Nope, this is a uh, pretty well stock. It's an original V8 truck, and it, it actually still has a two barrel on it, and they've used the, the Holly Sniper two barrel unit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's all pretty well original minus the fuel injection, which is great, because they, they're a pretty nice driving vehicle. And you're able to tune this stock old engine yep with the the holly sniper throttle unit on it and that improves its performance the way it grips on and yeah drivability yeah so it, you know a lot of them are kind of cold natured if it's really you know cold starts especially in cold weather can be difficult we can make this work really well and you know where you hop in and you turn the key and you don't have to let the vehicle warm up you can just put it in like gear and start days. driving you know <laughs> and it kind of adds a little bit of a modern convenience to your old car. Which is a huge factor because these engines, as we have seen on the channel over and over again, we've had engines that are running yeah. and working and absolutely fine that are 50 years old. I've seen, we came across one that was almost 70 years old, 80 year old engine, but it yeah. still turns on, it still works. Yeah. But these things here, and with people like yourself, you're able to tune it and get it back to what it needs to be in order to function today. Yeah. And a lot of people don't give credit to the old cars. That's what people drove every single day. That's, that's the option. That was a car. So, and there's no reason why you can't continue driving an old car as long as it's kept up well. And the engines were made so well. Oh, great. We saw and yeah. saw my fascination when we, you know, tore down the 350, that everything inside it was just, it was beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so does um, CNC machining play a part with some of the stuff that you do out here at all? Oh yeah. What is that? How does that um, come into play? Yeah, so between the machining and the printing, we're able to help these guys because a lot of times there'll be a part that they don't make anymore mm -hmm. or a part that's on back order. We can't get it for a month and we can't hold up a car for a whole month. For instance, the, that Ferrari that's in the showroom, the green one, that one had several um, rubber parts and a couple plastic pieces, like the uh, door jam switches, mm -hmm. that when you open the door, the interior lights come on. Yeah. Well, the plastic parts in those were broken and they don't make them. That's a 1970 Ferrari there. Uh, 78 or 79 or oh, something. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, and you can't get them well, we want to continue putting the car together and you know get it to get it to the owner because they want to go out and enjoy it. The weather's beautiful right now. So we can literally design and machine or print any of the parts same day wow. and continue the build. You know, you need to put the door together. And you can't continue putting the door together without without the parts that are inside of it. Absolutely. So, and a lot of these things, they don't know they need that part until they need it right now. Until you need it. And it, and it helps to have those machines in the back there with yep. a 3D printing machine, printer as well as the CNC machines. Yep. Wow. So between that and, you know, the, the big fancy shiny parts that everybody sees, there's always the little parts that are inside of something that you never see. 
that are equally as vital to the car driving down the road, but you just never see them. And we're able to really help move the show along with that capability in-house. Have you printed some things here? Uh, for nothing the on this truck, but we have done, I mean, pretty much every vehicle has, has things printed on it. This one, we just haven't done a whole, whole lot. We've done the floors, uh, replaced the floor pans in here. That's what it was in for. Okay. And now we're just doing, you know, basic maintenance work and trying to get it going. He wants to r drive it again. Yep. And okay. that's, that's what we'll do. I believe the owner here is local with this one. And they have several other old cars, and I see them driving around town all the time. Oh, yeah. okay. So that's that's why it's very important that we do as good a job as we can to make these things really, you know, modern drivable. Absolutely. Well, is there anything that you can show me or to get my hands into it? Or is that way too advanced? Oh, no, I can go grab a, a laptop from up in Jesse's office, and we can start taking a look at the, the tune file that's currently in the truck and seeing what we find and explore it. No idea what that is, but I'm <laughs> gonna find out and you guys gonna watch me. Let's do it. All right, let me go grab a laptop. <laughs> That's normally where I sit. All right, so I'm gonna sit in the passenger side. One sentence to define tuning. Oh, <laughs> one sentence. All right, one statement. I can always um, be if you like. It's an art and a science. <laughs> to get things to line up. Yeah. The you, machine, the engine, with the yeah. transmission. Yeah, it's, you start out like scientifically, like, you know, you, you do this, if you see this, you do this, you do this, and it's all stuff that you kind of learn with time. But then at the end of the day, there is judgment calls on everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you you go off book at the end. Oh, you go off book. Okay, but yeah. all engines have to be tuned. Yep. All even out of the yep. crate, new engines. Uh, no. So a lot of them that come with an engine management system, you know, like some of the GM and Ford and Chrysler and all them, they have their crate, you know, kit that yep. comes with the harness and the computer, and those things are rock solid. I mean, they're you know they have millions of dollars in development of some very very sharp people and they tune every single parameter of that engine on an engine dyno with a load cell and i mean they just do a phenomenal job they so, have so many resources involved in it so if i'm rebuilding my 350 as some of you might have seen in that process sometime along the way somewhere along the way i'm going to have to get that engine tuned yeah okay it's good to know yeah all right greg what am i looking at all right, so what you have here is the interface for a Holley Sniper EFI, and that's the loading screen when you first open the program. So the first thing that we'll do is I'll turn the ignition on, and you will click Download from ECU to download the tune onto the computer. And you'll just click OK. And then in five seconds, that'll close, or you can hit enter. Now, where is this connected to? This is connected to the um, Holly system up under the hood? Yep. Okay, yep. press enter. Yeah, it's already done. Mm -hmm. So, what we have up here is all the different um, categories of tuning. So this is your fuel tuning, where you tune your fuel tables and fuel mixtures. This is specifics to the engine, your sensors, where you configure your coolant, what coolant temperature sensor you have, all that sort of thing. That is your ECU specifics. So that is what Holly unit you have, what, um, how many cubic inches your engine mm -hmm. is, all that type of thing. The next one over is idle. So that's your idle tuning, like what you want your idle RPM to be at and how quick you want it to react to changes, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that is your spark, so that's your ignition, how many degrees of advance. And, you know, there's quite a few tables. If you, if you click on any of those, like, for instance, click on the fuel. Oh, it opens it up. Okay. Yeah, you just click right on the injector there. And that, oh, one more time. And that opens up wow. all of your tabs. So this is your base fuel table. 
So this is manifold vacuum versus RPM. So I have to go through and populate that entire table to get correct numbers. And each one would be different for each engine. Yep. Now I can start, you know, quite often because I've done enough of them that I have done similar engines. So I can start by, you know, copy pasting several of these tables mm -hmm. over. But then ultimately we have to drive the vehicle and then that's why I'm always in the passenger seat like you are right now. So Steve is very good and so is Jesse where they'll drive the car and they can put it in specific conditions that I'm concerned with. Okay. And they can, they can repeat because I'll make a change and they'll be able to do exactly the same thing over again and I'll see what my change did. So it's very important that whoever you're doing it with, that you have that kind of connection, I guess, yep. where you both can communicate because you're relying on what the data that you're getting from the computer based on the way they're driving yeah. at that moment. It's, it's like, a, like a relationship between a race car driver and their team mm -hmm. where a really good race car driver can communicate what the car is doing back to his team so that they know at the pit stop what to do except for we're sitting next to each other and he can give me real-time feedback and I yeah. can make that change. So it's really good to, to operate as a team. It, you can do it just on your own, like me. But man, does it go so much quicker when I'm able to sit in the passenger seat and somebody else drives the car and I don't have to you know, pull over on the side of the road, make the change, continue. So can this be connected while we're driving? Absolutely. So you just lower the hood? Yep. Slightly and keep the cable because there, there is a cable here, everybody. Yeah. And that stays connected and you just turn it on and off you go. Yep. And one thing we've been doing on a lot of cars that are, you know, full builds at the shop here is we hardwire these wires up under the dash and we have a proprietary connector that goes under there that uses a cell phone cable. So that makes any, your life so much easier, yeah, doesn't it? You're at, you don't have to either have one of these expensive cords yeah. on hand, and you don't have to have anything special, it's just a cell phone cord, and you don't have to dig for it. You know, it's right here under the dash on every car that we build. So you can take your cell phone cord, plug it in, plug it into the computer, and it's really good for customers too. If somebody is, you know, a thousand miles away from home and they want you to look at something. As long as they have access to a laptop, it doesn't have to be anything special. Oh, wow. And just a cell phone cord, they can connect in and we can make changes anywhere in the whole world as long as they have internet connect. Or you internet have spoken access. like a true engineer where they get just the simplify things using just basic, simple stuff, but it makes such a big difference. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Because just having this cord, this is a very specific cord that has a converter box and such in it. So if somebody needs to use that and they don't have the cord, mm -hmm. <laughs> you've got nothing. You've got nothing. Yeah. So wow. we like to do that on everything if we possibly can. There's a lot involved with tuning everybody. We all hear about it. You know, we see ads on it. We see YouTube videos on it, but there is a lot involved. Yeah. And if you click at some of these other ones, as you go down, you'll see. So that, this is the same table, but shown as a graphical form. Uh -huh. And then you have a learn table, which this, this one, this is as we downloaded it. So if you look, I see that immediately we do have an issue with this truck. All these blue numbers, these are what it, you know, because they advertise these as self-learning systems mm -hmm. or self-tuning. That's what they mean by that. So if you look in these uh, higher areas, these are higher RPM high load well higher rpm would be over here they haven't they have nobody's been beating on this truck yet okay which is good but this is high load and you'll see this isn't too far off you know you'll see six seven percent mm -hmm. added fuel which i always like to see those those numbers to be negative it means we have a little bit too much fuel we're a little bit on the safe side but in here you'll see there's spots that are adding what, 30, 30 some 30. odd percent? 30.7, 30.8. Yeah. So what does that mean, that they're using that much extra fuel yep. during that RPM? Yep, to, to hit what our target air fuel ratio is. Okay. And so, you want to keep get that number lower? Yep. I like to see those numbers, you know, be within 5% oh, or, wow. or tighter. Wow. 
And then when we're done with that, I turn, you know, I, I correct that first table we looked at so that we don't get large numbers in this table. And then I turn the learn off. And the reason for that is we don't want it. Sometimes if any anomaly happens, it can learn a bad habit. And then you have a drivability issue. So, so because I, the engine then just relies on making that same mistake yep, once it does it, yep, it, it makes can do it again. Something weird happens one time, and then it learns a bad habit, and mm -hmm. then it just keeps on and keeps on, and it will get worse and worse and worse. And we run into a lot of those vehicles that show up here that they ran great, but then the more I drove it, the worse it, the worse it was, and now yeah. I can't drive it anymore. And it's usually that the learn has been left on and you have something like this that happens. This is so fascinating that all of these numbers is getting the data from the, um, the Holly EFI system that's there under the hood. That is then connected to which, what part of the engine? So it's on top of the intake manifold. On top of the intake manifold? Yep. Okay. And it has throttle blades that meter the air going into the engine. And then it cycles the fuel injectors that give it the appropriate amount of fuel for the air that's in the engine. Okay, there's a lot more than just that small box. Yep. <laughs> that's what we see up at the top, right? Yep. So, okay, wow. And then next down we have like a target air fuel ratio, which this one, yep. See, the table's all grayed out because mm -hmm. they've just set it up the way that they have this little touch screen that comes with them. It's a three and a half inch touch screen and they set them up. It, it's crude, but it works. What I will do is change that from simple. And if you just click simple and then do a 2D table, now I'll be able to populate that. And if you click graph, you'll see that the whole table is, it's very blocky, all flat lines, big steps between them. Mm -hmm. It will look more smooth and flowing like, like a wave in the ocean when okay. I'm done with it. Okay, that's, that's when you know it needs a lot of work. Yeah, so I, I won't have all those transition areas in it anymore. It'll be, you know, just, just smoother running and better driving. And it would actually vehicle. reflect that on the picture, on the image as well. It would actually be smooth waves. Yeah. Wow, th that is pretty cool. Honestly, I think I have learned so much in the last 15, 20 minutes with you <laughs> than I ever have about any of the um, engine stuff, yeah. especially when it comes to the tuning and the electronics, because this is modern day yep. tuning that we're looking at. And, you know, a lot of the aftermarket fuel injection systems have done a great job of simplifying it from the OEM stuff, like on a, a factory car. There's so many things that you know, you have teams and teams of engineers calibrating this Yeah. that, I mean, they do an outstanding job. Holly, I've seen it in so many plastics before, and um, it always has been spoken of very highly yeah. on just how well it works, that EFI system. Yeah, it's just the, the whole bolted on and go, that works sometimes, but a lot of times there's, you know, little issues that somebody that has the cord and the software and knows what they're doing can really help that out a lot. And, you know, improve the fuel mileage, improve the drivability, improve the starting, just make it a more pleasant vehicle than an out of the box, bolted on and go. Wow. That is pretty cool. We're gonna continue on and um, head back inside and see if there's anything more in the CNC machining and then show you the rest of Greening's auto company, but this is awesome. It's a lot of fun. I get to ride in some some really cool cars. And actually see this. what's happening right yeah. here in front of you. And um, nah, this is pretty cool. And another new thing, now something new again for me. So I'm super pumped.